Good morning, Advent Hope. It's my privilege to welcome each of you here today. <laughs> and uh, today is going to be a very blessed day, is it not? Because um, we get to hear a very special person who's been a servant of God for a number of years now. How many is that? 50. About 50. So he, he owned up to it. Uh, 50 years in the service of God. And so we're thankful to have Elder Preby here today. And uh, there's one thing for sure, we're all going to be blessed. So Elder Preby, we thank you very much for being with us. And good morning. Good, ready to go. Good morning to each one of you. We're looking forward to a good Sabbath day here. We had a great weekend last year, and we're looking forward to another one just like that or better this weekend. I'm going to begin right away with a text in Hebrews. Let's pray first. Father in heaven, as we study this morning one of the most important subjects in all of Scripture, I pray that you will guide us by your Holy Spirit, direct our thoughts and our minds toward you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you turn to Hebrews chapter 9? Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to look at verse 24. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And the question I'm going to ask this morning is a very simple question. What is Christ doing in the heavenly sanctuary right now that makes a difference in the way I live my life right now? How does that change? What he's doing in the heavenly sanctuary, how does that change the way my practical life is lived? That's the question. And that's the issue that we're going to address this morning. I'm going to start with a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357 and 358. The blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. Now, right there, you've heard a sentence that is not going to be heard outside Seventh-day Adventist theology. Because most Christians believe <clears throat> that when we confess our sins, they disappear and they're gone forever, never to be seen again throughout eternity. But this says, the blood of Christ was not to cancel the sin. It, the sin, would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. Two words, again, you will not hear outside of Seventh-day Adventist theology, final atonement. Atonement. What does that mean? Then by virtue of the atoning blood of Christ, the sins of all the truly penitent will be blotted from the books of heaven. Thus the sanctuary will be freed or cleansed from the record of sin. In the type, this great work of atonement or blotting out of sins was represented by the services of the Day of Atonement. So we're going to be focusing on the Day of Atonement the final atonement, and the blotting out of sins from the heavenly sanctuary, which is perhaps one of the most important subjects we need to understand as we live in, their, in these very momentous times. Came across something from a revival speaker doing kind of the same things that I've been doing, but this one about 60 years ago. He said, the concept of the final atonement is the one and only contribution that Adventists have made in Christian theology. Now you think about that. 
We didn't contribute the Sabbath. We had to be persuaded by a, a nice Seventh-day Baptist lady that the Sabbath was worth considering. We didn't contribute our, the doctrines. Others had found them before us. Baptism by immersion, you run down the list. But final atonement, you're not going to hear about that in the Reformation. You're not going to hear about that in Wesley's Reformation later on. Final atonement is totally unique to Seventh-day Adventism. And then he said, there must be a refusal to be embarrassed with this peculiar teaching. You know what? We've gotten embarrassed because this is not a popular teaching. Whenever Christians hear us talk about final atonement, they say, what? The atonement was completed at the cross. What, are you, what do you mean, final atonement? That takes away from the glory of the cross. We want to focus on Jesus' death on the cross as the only important thing that matters. So this has become a very difficult subject for Adventists. How many Sabbath school lessons, how many camp meeting sermons have you heard on the final atonement in the last 30 years? Many, he said, now teach that the saints will not be sinless until the second advent of Christ, but such a teaching must result in casting aside the doctrine of a cleansed sanctuary before Jesus comes. It must lead to a rejection of the final atonement in the most holy place and the special sealing to take place in the minds of the 144,000. You know, Adventism, especially our teachings about the end of time, if you pull out one plank, a whole houseful comes with it. You can't disconnect one, one teaching and say, we won't talk about that, because then we lose a number of other truths that fall right in line with that. A couple of statements from Ellen White, this one from Early Writings, page 254. The minds of all, now that word all is very important. The minds of all who embrace this message are directed to the most holy place where Jesus stands before the ark, making his final intercession for all those for whom mercy still lingers. The minds of how many? All who embrace this message are directed to what Jesus is doing in the most holy place. And one more, Testimonies, Volume 5, 575. And this one is really important. All, it starts out with that word again, all need to become more intelligent in regard to the work of the atonement which is going on in the sanctuary above. Notice, not which was done at the cross, but which is going on. When this grand truth, now that's a very interesting phrase. Ellen White doesn't use the word grand truth very often. When this grand truth is seen and understood, those who hold it will work in harmony with Christ to prepare a people to stand in the great day of God, and their efforts will be successful. Have you heard about finishing the work? When this grand truth is seen and understood, then their efforts will be successful. Maybe that's why we're still kind of floundering a bit and not really getting things together as the way we should because we, we have ignored something really, really important. So what I'm going to do this morning, I'm going to take us on a little journey through a very specific book that was written many years ago. Uh, it's still in print, and I really would advise you to get it, read it carefully. I'm going to be focusing on the ne next to the last chapter. This is the clearest explanation I have ever read in my lifetime of what the final atonement is all about and what it means in Seventh-day Adventism. Now, maybe you know that the author, M. L. Andreessen, has been attacked heavily in recent years because this is not a popular teaching anymore. This is not something we like to talk about. And he, he has really been hit very hard. But I recommend this book to you if you want to study the sanctuary as the very best there is. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through uh, parts, just little parts of this and comment as we go. And we will see what he has to say about this final atonement that we're dealing with. And we'll just start out like right here. The final demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity is still in the future. Now that's interesting in itself. Look at all the martyrs and the faithful ones of past centuries, still in the future. 
Christ showed the way. He took a human body and in that body demonstrated the power of God. Men are to follow his example and prove that what God did in Christ, he can do in every human being who submits to him. Do you believe that? That what he did in Christ, he can do in each one of us. And then he made a very interesting statement. The world is awaiting this demonstration. You know, I don't think, I don't think the world in general has seen a very good picture of Christianity. They know about colonization, they know about exploitation, they know about Christians, and they haven't been too happy, many of the world's populations. For instance, Mahatma Gandhi made a very, statement, very famous statement, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. Maybe that's why we haven't had the success that we would have hoped for. Here's another one. Juan is a very precocious 12-year-old. He reads his Quran regularly. He prays five times a day. He takes part in religious discussions at the local mosque and is a moving force among the young people there. I asked him if he had always been a Muslim. No, I used to belong to a Christian church here in Cuba, he told me. What about your family, I asked. Oh, they are still going to that church, but they are also sometimes coming to the mosque with me. Why did you decide to become a Muslim, I asked. He looked at me very seriously and said, I was looking for a religion that had higher standards and clear answers to my questions. Isn't that a tragedy? Higher standards and clear answers to my questions. I don't think the world in general has seen a very good picture of Christianity. I think that sentence is exactly right. Continuing on, when it has been accomplished, the end will come. God will have fulfilled his plan. He will have shown himself true and Satan a liar. His government will stand vindicated. Now that's a key word, vindicated. The government of God vindicated. All right, let's just continue on here. The plan of salvation must of necessity include not only forgiveness of sin, but complete restoration. Salvation from sin is more than forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness presupposes sin and is conditioned upon breaking with it. Sanctification is separation from sin and indicates deliverance from its power and victory over it. The first is a means to neutralize the effect of sin. The second is a restoration of power for complete victory. That's what we're wanting to focus on, complete victory. Thus it shall be with the last generation of men living on the earth. And one thing just to remind you, Elder Andreasen wrote this many, many years ago before the political correctness of our time. The word men is a generic term meaning men and women at the time he was writing. It still does, by the way. Through them, God's final demonstration of what he can do with humanity will be given. He will take the weakest of the weak, those bearing the sins of their forefathers, and in them show the power of God. They will be subjected to every temptation, but they will not yield. They will demonstrate that it is, po that it is possible to live without sin. Incredible statement, that it is possible. The very demonstration for which the world has been looking and for which God has been preparing. It will become evident to all that the gospel really can save to the uttermost. God has found true in his sayings. Can we trust what God says in simple terms? It is in the last generation of men living on the earth that God's power unto sanctification will stand fully revealed. The demonstration of that power is God's vindication. In other words, we don't vindicate God. He vindicates his word through the ones who are willing to let him do that. It clears him of any and all charges which Satan has placed against him. In the last generation, God is vindicated and Satan defeated. This may need, he said, some further amplification. So we'll skip along in this chapter a little farther to get some more high points of what we need to see. The demonstration which God intends to make with the last generation on earth means much both to the people and to God. Can God's law really be kept? That is a vital question. That was the very beginning of Satan's challenge, Lucifer's challenge against God. We don't need a law. 
we can figure things out very well by ourselves. Can God's law really be kept? Many deny that it can be done. That's most of the Christian world. We can't keep the law. That's why Jesus kept it for us and credits it to our account. Many deny that it can be done. Others glibly say it can. Could that be us? Don't we say, here are they that keep the commandments of God? When the whole question of commandment keeping is considered, the problem assumes large proportions. God's law is exceedingly broad. It takes cognizance of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It judges motives as well as acts, thoughts as well as words. Commandment keeping means entire sanctification, a holy life, unswerving allegiance to right, entire separation from sin, and victory over it. Well may mortal man cry out, who is sufficient for these things? If you've never asked that question, I don't know what planet you live on. Who can ever be like that? Yet, to produce a people that will keep the law is the task which God has set himself and which he expects to accomplish. Now, that's the key word right there. He doesn't expect you and me to accomplish it because we can't. But he can do amazing things. And he can do what is totally impossible for human beings to even think about doing. When the statement and challenge are issued by Satan, no one can keep the law, it is impossible. If there be any that can do it or that have done it, show them to me, where are they that keep the commandments? And I love this, God will quietly answer, here they are, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Won't it be a day when God can say that quietly to, to Satan? Satan, your challenge, look, just watch, there they are, here are they. What a day that will be. When God commands men to keep his law, it does not serve his purpose, the purpose he has in mind, just to have only a few men keep it, just enough to show it can be done. It is not in line with God's character to pick outstanding men of strong purpose and superb training and demonstrate through them what he can do. It is, it is much more in harmony with his plan to make his requirements such that even the weakest need not fail. Do you feel weak today? I hope so. So that none can ever say that God demands that which can be done by only a few. It is for this reason that God has reserved his greatest demonstration for the last generation. This generation bears the results of accumulated sins. If any are weak, they are. If any suffer from inherited tendencies, they do. If any have an excuse because of weakness of any kind, they have. If therefore these can keep the commandments, there is no excuse for anyone in any other generation not doing so also. Have you noticed something about God? He picks the worst of times to do his greatest works. Whether it's Israel at the Red Sea or the time when Jesus came to this earth or this generation in which we're living at probably the lowest level of morality we have ever seen. All right, near the end now of this uh, chapter. God is ready for the challenge. He has bided his time. The supreme exhibition has been reserved until the final context, contest. Out of the last generation, God will select his chosen ones, not the strong or the mighty, not the honored or rich, not the wise or the learned, but common, ordinary people will God take and through and by them make his demonstration. Satan has claimed that those who in the past have served God have done so from mercenary motives, that God has pampered them, and that he, Satan, has not had free access to them. If he were given full permission to press his case, they also would be won over. But he charges that God is afraid to let him do this. Give me a fair chance, Satan says, and I will win out. And so to silence forever Satan's charges, to make it evident that his people are serving him from motives of loyalty and right without reference to reward. Let's stop right there. Why are we Christians? Why, even beyond being Seventh-day Adventists, why are we Christians? Is it because of a hope that maybe sometime down the line we'll get to live forever in a beautiful place with no more sickness, no more troubles, no more wars, and we will be happy for the rest of eternity? What if, what if 
There were no promises of a new heaven and a new earth in Scripture. What if the only promise that was made in the Bible, it, it would be, if you serve me and follow my ways, you will live a happier life than if you disobey me. You will live out a rich, full life, and you will die, and that will be the end of it all. Would we be a Christian because we believe God's way is right without reference to reward? I'm glad the reward is there. I'm looking forward to it. But even if there were no rewards, would we serve God? Because God is true and Satan is false. That's the question he's asking here, and that's an important motivator, I think, for us. Why are we in this thing? Um, without reference to reward, to clear his own name and character of the charges of injustice and arbitrariness, and to show to angels and men that his law can be kept by the weakest of men under the most discouraging and most untoward circumstances. God permits Satan in the last generation to try his people to the utmost. They will be threatened, tortured, persecuted. They will stand face to face with death in the issuance of the decree to worship the beast and his image, but they will not yield. They are willing to die rather than to sin. My brothers and sisters, that's what I want more than anything else in my future, that willingness. If I have to die, I will not rebel against God again. Will we have that experience? Will they stand the test? To human eyes, it seems impossible. If only God would come to their rescue, all would be well. They are determined to resist the evil one. If need be, they will die, but they will not sin. Satan has no power and never has had to make any man sin. He can tempt, he can seduce, he can threaten, but he cannot compel. Are we clear on that point? He can only persuade and try to force. And now God demonstrates through the weakest of the weak that there is no excuse and never has been any for sinning. If men in the last generation can successfully repel Satan's attack, if they can do this with all the odds against them and the sanctuary closed, what excuse is there for man ever sinning? Why does Jesus close down the heavenly sanctuary? Why does he step out of the most holy place? Why does he close human probation? Not just to make it hard for the people who are living at that time. God doesn't do things like that. But he has to have a platform on which he can prove once and for all that he is telling the truth and Satan is lying. So he will close down the work of forgiveness, which is going on to this day, and I'm very thankful for it, so that there will be no favors given to any special group of people. Satan can do his worst. God will do his best. And the world and the universe will, will see who's telling the truth. Can God's law really be kept? That's the question. And the whole issue boils down to who's telling the truth and who's lying. That's why there's a close of human probation, because that's the only way God's name, government, and character can be vindicated and Satan be proved to be a liar. We're almost through with this chapter. The matter of greatest importance in the universe is not the salvation of men, important as that may seem. I think you've probably heard as I have, the most important work we do is saving our soul and saving other people. Well, this says no. The most important thing is the clearing of God's name from the false accusations made by Satan. If God's name isn't cleared from Satan's accusations, we're not going to heaven. There's going to be no end to the great controversy. The most important thing in all of the Bible is the vindication of God's name. And that's why the last generation is crucial to that vindication. Without them, it won't happen. The controversy is drawing to a close. God is preparing his people for the last great conflict. Satan is also getting ready. The issue is before us and will be decided in the lives of God's people. God is depending upon us as he did upon Job. Is his confidence well placed? You know, Job may be the first book ever written in the Bible. We're not sure, but that seems to be what it is. And it's very interesting that that first book is the picture of the last people who will live on this planet. 
and the vindication of God's name is what that book is all about and what God's last people are all about. It is a wonderful privilege of safe this people to help clear God's name by our testimony. It is wonderful that we are permitted to testify for him. It must never be forgotten, however, that this testimony is a testimony of life, not merely of words. To give people the light is more than to hand them a tract. Our life is the light. As we live, we give light to others. Without life, without our living the light, our words abide alone. But as our life becomes light, our words become effective. It is our life that must testify for God. Now, we all know that. We know it's not about words. We know it's about the way we live. But sometimes we forget, don't we? Sometimes we don't think about it as often as we should. And so now we're going to kind of give the last touch here. All this is closely connected with the work of the Day of Atonement. On that day, the people of Israel, having confessed their sins, were completely cleansed. They had already been forgiven. Now sin was separated from them. They were holy and without blame. The camp of Israel was clean. What a day that would have been to be alive on that day of atonement. Not one sin in the whole camp. The whole camp of Israel was clean. Well, for maybe half an hour. And then it started all over again. This has got to be different. This has got to be something bitter, better than that. We are now living in the great antitypical day of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Every sin must be confessed and by faith be sent beforehand to judgment. As the high priest enters into the most holy, so God's people now are to stand face to face with God. They must know that every sin is confessed, that no stain of evil remains. Now here's the sentence to summarize everything I want to say this morning. The cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven is dependent upon the cleansing of God's people on earth. How could it be any other way? If Jesus would cleanse the sanctuary of all the sins that were, have ever been committed, and then I come along later and lose my temper and say, Lord, please forgive me for one more time, he would, I would, he would uh, take that sin and cleanse it out. You would come along later, and you would maybe take a little money that wasn't yours, and you say, Lord, please forgive me. I shouldn't have done that. And he'd have to take that and cleanse it out. When could it ever end? When could it ever end? So the only way that heavenly sanctuary can be cleansed and sins blotted out is if the sins are blotted out here first, in my heart and in my life. Then he can cleanse the heavenly sanctuary. How important, then, that God's people be holy and without blame. In them, every sin must be burned out so that they will be able to stand in the sight of a holy God and live with the devouring fire. Well, there you have Elder Andreasen's understanding of what it is that Jesus is doing in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. He is preparing a people here on earth to do what no other group of people has ever done in 6,000 years of human history. As a group, they will be commandment keepers, not just an individual here and an individual there, not an Enoch or an Elijah, but a whole generation of people all at one time living in a bad world with bad natures, but having totally surrendered to the power of Jesus Christ. And the universe will be incredibly amazed that God could ever pull that one off. That is the biggest job God has ever set for himself in all of history. And God is going to say, it can be done. That's what Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary. I came across something that um, I think is just worth a minute of thought. Uh, sometimes, you know, when we hear the word 1844, Jesus' ministry in the most holy place, immediately we think of the word judgment. The investigative judgment begins in 1844, and that's true. But a a, 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 an editor of the review who is deceased now, said this, we should not equate the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary with the investigative judgment. One should instead say that the cleansing of the sanctuary involves a work of investigation, a work of judgment. In other words, don't focus on the secondary issue, focus on the primary issue. On the Day of Atonement, 
when Israel was gathered around the ark? Was there a judgment set up? Were there books of record being opened on that day? I don't read anything about that at all. I read a lot about removing sin. The high priest goes in and sacrifices for himself. Then he sacrifices for the people. Then he goes into the most holy place and brings out all of the sins that have accumulated, puts them upon the head of the scapegoat, and a fit man leads that goat out into the wilderness. The whole day is about cleansing. Yes, the judgment is involved because if you didn't afflict your soul on that day, you were cut off from the camp of Israel. Yes, the judgment was there, but it was not the primary focus. We have made the secondary focus of 1844, the judgment, the primary focus, and we have forgotten almost completely about the primary focus, which is preparing a people to live without sin at the close of probation. I think sometimes we get our focuses turned around by focusing on something good, which isn't the most important thing. I want to take you back to uh, Leviticus chapter 16, if you'd look that up with me. That is the chapter of the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16. And I'm just going to focus on the last phrases of this day. Verse 30. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 30. For on that day, the priest shall the priest make an atonement for you. So first of all, when people say, what do you mean final atonement? Atonement on the day of atonement. Here is the proof that there is an atonement being made on the day of atonement. You know, what, what was the place where Christ's sacrifice was most clearly revealed in the sanctuary system? What was the place? What was the spot? It was in the courtyard. What was it? The altar of burnt offering. That symbolized Christ's death for the sins of the world. But now we're at the Day of Atonement, just once a year. And on that day, notice, it says, the priest shall make an atonement for you. So we are on very solid biblical ground to say there is something about this last part of the great controversy which is part of the atonement process part of the process that began on Calvary but was not finished there and is now being finished. And what is that finishing? To cleanse you that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. That's the final aspect of the atoning process, a cleansed people, a holy people. Um, another statement from Ellen White, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 520. We are in the great day of atonement and the sacred work of Christ for the people of God that is going on at the present time in the heavenly sanctuary should be our constant study. How are we doing on that? We hardly ever touch upon it. In the last quarterly, that we are in the last lesson of our quarterly, there was one page given to the final atonement. And it didn't even begin to talk about cleansing from sin. It just talked about the judgment beginning. We aren't even talking about it, and it should be our constant study. We should teach our children what the typical Day of Atonement signified, and that it was a special session of great humiliation and confession of sins before God. The antitypical Day of Atonement is to be of the same character. And once again, I don't think that we're giving our young people who are coming up in the ranks of Adventism clear answers as to what it's all about to be a Seventh-day Adventist living at this period of time. I think we're not giving them a vision of what it is to be and how it is to be and what we are to do. I'm going to take you to Ecclesiastes right now. Strange place to talk about Day of Atonement. Ecclesiastes. And we're going to look at chapter 3, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born and a time to die, 
a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. So you get the picture here. This is not talking about sin. This is talking about appropriate times and places for things to be done. Now look at verse 4. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. All right. What does that have to do with the Day of Atonement? There were two feasts close to each other, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles. What do you think? On the Day of Atonement, was that a time for laughing and dancing? I don't think so, do you? How about weeping and mourning for the sins which we have committed? Now, the Feast of Tabernacles was a celebration of the end of the year and the harvest that had come in, and now the camp had been freed from sin by the Day of Atonement. How about that? Was that an appropriate time for laughing and dancing? Yes. So you see, appropriate times and places. We are in the Day of Atonement. We're living in the Day of Atonement. What is the atypical Feast of Tabernacles? When does that take place? When, Jesus Christ comes. when He comes in heaven. That's the antitypical day, uh, Feast of Tabernacles. My friends, I think we've gotten that mixed up too. We think it's a time for celebration and laughing and dancing these days when it's a time for weeping and mourning for the sins that have delayed Christ's coming so many years. The time for laughing and dancing is when the victory has been gained. And if Jesus wants to teach me any dance steps on the sea of glass, I will be happy to learn them. So we have gotten things twisted again, truths in the wrong place. And that's what Ecclesiastes is telling us, I think, that sometimes we get things just misplaced, don't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. And again, in talking to our young people, I think we say too many times, we do this because the church says, or Ellen White says. We don't give good answers, I think, to our young people when they ask really interesting questions about lifestyle, how we live our lives. So what I'm going to do to finish this up this, uh, this morning is we are going to talk about I can change it. Living in the day of atonement. What is it to live in the day of atonement? How are our lives different than if we'd lived before 1844? What changes take place because we're living in the day of atonement? Where did the 12 tribes come from? The 12 tribes that God brought out of Egypt and led into the promised land came out of a beautiful, well-organized, happy home, right? Oh, you've read that story once or twice, have you? Wow. Twelve sons of Jacob. You know, we hit Jacob pretty hard as to the faults of his sons, but maybe the only real problem <clears throat> with Jacob, he might have loved Rachel, a little too much. You know, he'd been sent up to uh, uh, away from his home because of his escapade with uh, his brother Esau. And, uh, and now a young woman caught his eye. And um, Laban was a smart guy, you know. Laban said, I see this young man has an eye for my daughter. I think I can get something out of him. I can get some monetary advantage. So when uh, Jacob asks for Rachel's hand in marriage, Laban says, of course, there's no problem with that at all. You can have my daughter in marriage. All you have to do is work seven years. It'll go by, go by just like that. Just a little work for a lovely young lady. And he, Jacob loves say, uh, Rachel so much that he says, sure, I'll do that. I'll be happy to do that. Well, you know the rest of the story. That night, Jacob got the biggest surprise of his life. Wrong woman. Can you just, I would have loved to have been in the tent of Laban when Jacob came storming into that tent the next day. I mean storming, fire coming out of all his mouth, ears, and eyes. And uh, Laban is just very relaxed, I think. That's the way I picture it. Uh, Jacob, I know you're very angry right now, and you have good right to be. But, you know, there's a way that this can be fixed easily. 
don't, don't get yourself all up in, a, in an uproar on this. You know, Jacob, you understand that it's never proper in our society to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older daughter is married. That would be a disgrace to the older daughter and to the father of the older daughter. So that's why you had to have Leah rather than Rachel. Now also, remember this, Jacob, uh, it is always better in our society to have two wives. That will get you many more children and much more land and property, and you will be well better off than if you only had one wife. You can have Rachel. Of course you can. I promised her to you. All you have to do is work seven more years. That's all. And it'll go by just like the last seven did. And Jacob loves Rachel so much that he agrees to this preposterous deal that he has been given. Well, you know the rest of the story. Rachel doesn't bear any children. And again, we don't have quite the same idea of how it was back in those days. If you did not bear children, you were under the curse of God. Rachel, the favored wife, being cursed by God. Leah making sure everybody knew that because Leah had children. No problem with her having children, apparently. And so this becomes a thorn in the side of Rachel every day at the watering hole or wherever they got their water being labeled as under the curse of God because she can't have children. And finally one day she comes to Jacob and says, I can't stand it anymore. I can't tolerate this. I am cast out of the favor of, of everyone in the, in the whole camp. There's only one way we can solve this, Jacob. I have a handmaid. And you, if you will take my handmaid as my helper wife, she will bear children, and in our custom, they will be counted as my children because she is my servant. And Jacob loves Rachel so much, he agrees to save Rachel's good name. And sure enough, she bears children. Rachel's disgrace is removed. No longer does she have to hide her face. She can be a regular member of the family. But you know, Leah is watching from the other side. And Leah says to Jacob, what's this about? That's two against one. That's not fair. If you can give Rachel a helper wife, you just better give me a helper wife, Jacob. And Jacob, with a sense of fairness, agrees that that's only proper. So Leah has a helper wife. So now there are four wives there involved. And children are born. Eventually, Rachel bears children as well. Can you imagine living in that household? Can you imagine the words that were spoken between sons about whose mother is better than whose mother and who is favored by God and who is not favored by God? Can you imagine the anger? You can see now maybe why those young men were willing to kill their brother not just because he had visions and not because he wore a fancy coat, but because they hated each other and they were willing to do whatever it took to be the number one. My friends, out of that polygamous, dysfunctional marriage came the 12 tribes of Israel. Their names will be on the New Jerusalem. Consider that. Did God bless that family? Did he bless that family? The only answer is yes. He blessed that family greatly. The forerunners of the Messiah. Through that lineage comes the most sacred being ever to appear on planet Earth. Through that squabbling, hateful, polygamous relationship. On the basis of that story, surely I can follow that example and be scripturally true. I can have more than one wife too, can't I? That'll be just fine because the Bible blesses that. And you know, folks, it's not just theoretical. There are people in our United States, and I know you've read about them and heard about them, that believe that that's the way we must live today. That is God's plan. And we can only be favored by God if we follow that plan of polygamous marriage. Let's try another one. If you were in bad shape financially, if you couldn't pay your debts, 
there was a way out. You could sell yourself as a slave to someone who would pay your debts, take care of your family. And you could work for him without wages. He would take care of your finances. Now, the rule was, and God set up this rule, that you could only be a slave for six years. On the seventh year, you had to go free. You could not, be, you could not sell yourself into lifetime slavery. There's one way around that. You remember how it was done? If you decided that in your family's house it was better than in the way you were living before, your master was a beautiful master and you loved the master, you could have your ear pierced to show that you chose voluntary lifetime slavery. But six years was the norm without that. Did God sanction slavery? Did he regulate slavery? Yes, he did. And not far from where we are right now, in fact, right where we are right now, 150 years ago, people would come to churches just like this and say, absolutely, it is our God-given right to have slaves. God blessed it in the beginning. And any talk of not having slaves is, is, is a heresy against the word of God. It has been defended on the basis of the word of God. Let's take one more. If you had been standing by Moses, uh, close to Moses, when he came down from the mount and smashed those tables of stone into smithereens, you know what you would have heard next from Moses as the word of the Lord? All who are on the Lord's side and have not participated in this idolatry, come and stand by me. And you know what happened? The whole tribe of Levi came and stood beside Moses. What was the next command by Moses from God to the Levites who stood by his side? <laughs> Get your sword, go out and kill all the unfaithful ones who have, who have done this abomination before the Lord. How would you have liked to be in that situation? Put it in the Adventist world. Not all Adventists are faithful Adventists. Go out and kill all the unfaithful Adventists right now. Because those were Israelites. They were all Israelites. Go out and kill those who are not true to the word of God. That would be a tough place to be, I think. So, did God bless polygamy? Yes. Did he regulate slavery? Yes. Did he command people to kill? Yes. And on the basis of that, Nations and people today have holy wars, have you noticed? Because we are doing God's will by going out and killing the enemy. Now, let's change the subject completely. When our young people or people of other churches come to us and ask us about some of our habits, our lifestyle uh, habits, for instance, we say, we should not drink alcohol. That is not the right way to live a Christian life. Um, how about uh, those statements in the New Testament about take a little wine for your stomach's sake? Um, what answer do we give as to why we do not choose to use alcohol? Our Christian friends will say to us, you Adventists always go one step beyond the Bible. The Bible teaches moderation. All that the Bible teaches, for instance, for the elders and de deacons is they should not be given too much wine. That means drunkenness. That is forbidden by God, but not moderation. Moderation is totally acceptable in the Bible. You always go one step beyond the Bible. You talk about teetotaling, total abstinence. The Bible teaches moderation. Well, another one. We say that the best diet for us today is a vegetarian diet. And once again, our children and our Christian friends say to us, where is that in the Bible? Where do you have evidence of that? When Abraham saw three people coming across the plains toward him, what did he fix up for them? 
fatted calf. When the prodigal came home from his journey, what did the father fix for him? Same thing. You Adventists, there you go again. Always going one step beyond the Bible. Say, making things harder for people. Adventists also say we should not wear jewelry. That is not the appropriate thing to do as Christians. I came across this little letter to uh, the Adventist Review. The Bible is more pro-jewelry than anti-jewelry. Job, whom God said was righteous, received several gold rings from relatives. Joseph received a ring and gold chain from Pharaoh. Abraham sent Rebekah a gold ring for her nose, two gold bracelets, and gold and silver jewelry. How about that? What is this business about no jewelry at all? Modest jewelry. That's the principle of the Bible, not abstinence. You're always going one step beyond the Bible. What answers do we give when people challenge us on lifestyle issues like that, living in the Day of Atonement? Well, folks, I'm going to give you a principle. Let's go back to those other three examples I mentioned, polygamy, uh, slavery, and destruction of life. I'm going to give you a principle right now. If you don't understand this principle, you cannot understand the Bible, especially the Old Testament. Here's the principle. God blesses, he regulates, and he commands things that he hates. Things that he... Do you... Let's just put it this way right now. Do you feel comfortable with polygamy right now, today? Would you feel that's the next step you need to take in your religious experience? You say, no, I'm not involved in that. Would you feel comfortable with slaves today, right now? Once again, you're repulsed by that. You say, no, under no circumstances. Would you feel comfortably taking, taking up your gun, sword, whatever, and killing unfaithful Adventists? And you say, no, no, not at all. You hate all those things. Do you think God loves those things? The God that we worship? There's no question that he despises all of those things just as you do. Then why? Why does God bless, regulate, and tolerate, and command things that he hates? Because our God is the most incredible God we have ever come across. Just take us as individuals. Did God tell you everything you would ever need to know the first day you were born again and baptized? Or has he been leading you along the way slowly? Did you have some things in your life maybe going on for a while that you didn't even understand how bad they were, but God blessed you anyway? God teach, treats nations and churches and people like babies, and he tolerates things that he doesn't like in them, just as we tolerate things that we don't like, even in our children as they're growing up. We want them to grow out of those things, not be forced out of those things. And God te treats nations and people like that. He tolerates, he blesses, he regulates things that are not in his plan at all and will not be. Those, those things will not exist in the new earth, which tells us that it is not God's plan. But he takes us where we are and he understands our weakness. Even the Bible says sometimes he winks at the things we do because of the ignorance of the times. Two reasons for those things being blessed by God in the Old Testament, ignorance of the times and hardness of heart. God deals with both of those things, ignorance of the times and hardness of heart. And he blesses things that are not his plan at all. So, what about all these things that I've just mentioned? Do you really think, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> do you really think that moderate alcohol is a good thing to have as a principle for us today? Even if we didn't have, and there are texts in the Bible that are pretty clear on the dangers of alcohol use, but I came across this uh, recently. Recent studies are showing that even low or moderate amounts of alcohol causes cancer, of the larynx, esophagus, liver, colon, re rectum, and breast. And this is all alcoholic beverages, including beer, wine, etc. There is no safe level of alcohol intake 
when it comes to carcinogenesis. Are we really extreme when we say that is not a healthful way, a healthful part of diet? I don't think so. How about vegetarianism? Is it really extreme to believe that our diet should be a vegetarian diet? Well, let's take a couple of examples in the Bible that even show that what God's plan really was. What was the first diet all about? Genesis 1.29, the Genesis diet. You know what that was. What was the diet of all of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness? Wow, it wasn't even vegetarian, folks. It was vegan. 100%. And so this whole diet, and they didn't get sick, folks. Their clothes didn't even wear out. God has special blessings. And you know all the experience of Daniel. I don't have to go over that. Even though God allowed, for ignorance of the times, hardness of heart, a diet that was not his original plan, he showed by various examples what the real plan was. And what is going to be the real plan in the new earth? They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. So there are a few examples, aren't there, in Scripture? And how about jewelry? Well, there's an interesting thing I have found. When the Israelites went into apostasy in the Old Testament, there is mention of something being added in their lifestyle, jewelry. And when they repented of their apostasy, jewelry came off. That's a very interesting parallel. Remember Jacob fleeing with his wives from Laban? And they had their jewelry and their false gods with them, those little small gods that they put in the family altar. What did they bury under the oak tree together? the false gods, and the jewelry they buried under that oak tree. There's a parallel there in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, what does Paul say God is looking on? The heart, not what you put on, not the outside. He wants to see the real you. So I think there are quite a few principles for um, all of these things in the Bible that are pretty clear. Now here's the real, real point. Since it is clear that God has tolerated some things he does not approve of, since it is clear that he has even commanded things that are not his best plan, when we are living in the Day of Atonement, are we to look at the minimum levels of what God has allowed in Scripture because of his mercy and love and say, that's good enough for me, or are we to be looking at the highest levels that are the closest to God's plan that we can understand and live by that because this is the final challenge of Satan against God and God must be vindicated? Don't you think that that needs to be our purpose and our point and our reason for living a, a lifestyle in the Day of Atonement? Let me just put it simply. Martin Luther, I fully expect to see Martin Luther in heaven. I have no doubt, really, in my mind about that. He brought into existence a movement that we are the beneficiaries of. But Martin Luther, when you look at his life, he was not a health reformer. He had his tankard of ale every evening before he went to bed, regularly. Um, there were some Anabaptists. You know what an Anabaptist is? the forerunners of the Baptist church who believed in baptism by immersion, not infant baptism. We're more in the line of Anabaptists, frankly, than in, in the line of Lutheranism. And there were some Anabaptists living in a province right next to him. He told the prince of that province to kill all of the Anabaptists that he could find in his province because they were dooming their children to hell by not baptizing them as soon as they were born. That's Martin Luther. Was he living in a time of light or a time of darkness? We call it the Dark Ages for good reason, folks. Uh, probably it was as dark then or darker than it was during the time of the Israelites in terms of light from heaven. And Martin Luther was living up to the light that he had and his conscience and what he thought was right. I expect to see him in heaven. 
But can he vindicate God by those actions? There's no way God is vindicated by what he suggested and the way he lived in his lifestyle. He didn't vindicate. He could not be part of this final generation that will live before God without any sin. No sin in our lives that we will die rather than to sin against God. So Martin Luther can be saved, but he cannot vindicate God. My purpose for being an Adventist is not to get myself saved. My purpose is to vindicate God. Getting saved is a nice side benefit. But my purpose is to vindicate his name. And can I vindicate God's name by looking at those times of hardness of heart and ignorance of the will of God and say, that I'll live my life at that level. I really think we're not giving ourselves a clear picture of what it is to live in the Day of Atonement for the vindication of God's name. And we're not giving our young people good answers on that. We do this because the church says, no, we do it because we are in the generation that are going to come to the close of human probation and live before God without a mediator, without any sin, just as Christ did. That's why we live this kind of lifestyle. That's why my diet is the way it is. That's the, way, that's the reason my choices are the way they are because we live in the most unique period of human history that ever was. Final atonement, my friends, makes a huge, huge difference in the way we live our lives. And, no fo and folks, you know what? This is nothing new. M. L. Andreasen didn't come up with this. Back in 1888, in that period of time, A. T. Jones said this. The finishing of the mystery of God is the ending of the work of the gospel. And the ending of the work of the gospel is the taking away of all vestige of sin and the bringing in of everlasting righteousness, Christ fully formed within each believer, God alone manifest in the flesh of each believer in Jesus. Therefore, the very first work in the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the people. This was preliminary and essential to the cleansing of the sanctuary itself in the heart and life of each one of the people themselves bringing in everlasting righteousness. And here's the sentence. When the stream that flowed into the sanctuary was thus stopped at its source, then and then alone could the sanctuary itself be cleansed from the sins and transgressions which from the people by the intercession of the priest had flowed into the sanctuary. Therefore, by this, we are plainly taught that the service of our great high priest in the cleansing of the true sanctuary must be preceded by the cleansing of each one of the believers, the cleansing of each one who has a part in that service of the true high priest in the true sanctuary. What is Christ doing in the heavenly sanctuary right now that's different? He is preparing a people for the close of probation and for the seal of God and for walking into heaven without seeing death. He is preparing a unique generation that has never lived before on planet Earth as a generation. And he is going to do the most incredible work that has ever been seen in 6,000 years of human history. And we need to have this vision. A.T. Jones had it 120 years ago. M. L. Andreasen had it 60 years ago. We hardly ever talk about it anymore. This is a, a, a serious, serious lack in the Seventh-day Adventist church today, and we need to consider why we are Seventh-day Adventists and what it means. So, folks, let us pray, shall we? Father in heaven, forgive us, forgive us for our casualness about this eternity-demanding doctrine, the final atonement that it's more important than any other teaching that we have in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. May we never again let it slide. May we, may we make this our constant study, and most importantly, may we prepare ourselves to be that generation. Thank you for hearing us and doing the most miraculous thing that you have ever done in all of history. In Jesus' name, amen.